Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Kathy Van Dockenberg and we're gonna be talking all about flipping properties. One thing that real estate investors seem to get very excited about when they hear about the opportunity to make money relatively quickly in the real estate investing space. I'm so glad that Kathy's here to share her knowledge with you. Before we jump in with Kathy, um, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, let's get into it. Kathy, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join me. I really do appreciate that. Before we jump into our topic today, give everyone a bit of an intro on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor. Thanks, Darren. Thanks for having me on your channel. I have actually learned a ton from it. I do watch all of your videos and I love them all. Uh, so I live in British Columbia, about an hour east of Vancouver in Abbotsford. I started sort of accidentally as a real estate investor with um, uh, just uh, rentals. Um, I actually was a student rental landlord before I even knew there was such a thing and then went to a lot of pre-sales. Uh, they've been really great for me here in, in British Columbia and then single family homes, that kind of thing here in uh, Victoria in Abbotsford, Edmonton and Fort St. John. And then I've just discovered uh, the last few years flipping and I absolutely love renovations. Uh, so far I'm, I flip, just uh, renovate and sell. I haven't done any burrs yet, but that might be on the horizon. So how did you first get attracted to, you know, the idea of flipping properties um, beyond your love for renovation? HGTV. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, you know, I liked renovating and it was, it was uh, originally just because I thought, okay, well, this is a great way to make a little bit of money in real estate investing. And I, I love real estate. I want it to be a, a full-time real estate investor. Um, without being a salesperson, like a real estate agent, not that I have anything mm -hmm. against them. It's just, uh, it wasn't something I was aspiring to. So flipping just seemed like a great alternative. And, and why did you choose the markets that you did? And you, we were talking a little bit off air and, and, and remind everybody uh, or tell everyone which markets you're predominantly flipping properties in right now. So we call it the Fraser Valley, about an hour east of Vancouver. Uh, currently, I have four on the go in Alder Grove and one on the go in Mission. They're all with partners. Uh, the Alder Grove ones, I'm in charge of the entire project. Uh, the Mission one, uh, I'm sort of a helper. Uh, it's close to home. It's about a 15, 20-minute drive for me, so I can be hands-on. I can be there present when there's a, a fire. Um, <laughs> And so it does allow me that uh, sort of hands-on uh, ability to be there. And, and I can purchase all my own uh, finishes and um, just be available when needed. So I, I guess one of the, the biggest things that I've heard with, with flipping properties, and I've done a few in, in my day, I don't do a ton of it, but it is something that I have a little bit of experience with. Generally, the, the, the theory is you make your money on the buy. Um, and if you buy right, there's, there's enough margin that you can, that you can flip a property and make a decent profit. So how is it that you're finding uh, great opportunities in these markets? And I know that Vancouver and, and, the, and the Fraser Valley is very similar to Ontario right now and that the market is crazy and hot and which is great when you're selling, but how do you buy properties at a, at a bit of a discount? Yes. So Fortunately, we actually purchased right at the perfect time where the market was just starting to wake up from the COVID um, lull. And this beautiful thing happened in 2021 where the market just took off like crazy. So the ARV we had when we first started uh, running our numbers is completely like it feels like it was from 10 years ago. So the market has helped us quite a bit right now. Uh, but yes, I mean, typically properties that need to be renovated are quite a bit less expensive than the ones that are already beautifully finished. And not a lot of people want to come into a property and have to renovate it in order to move in because people are selling one, moving into the other. Nobody likes to live in a reno. And so it makes it a little bit more attractive for an investor because we can come in and still be reasonable and give the seller what they're looking for. But maybe the seller thinks that their property is worth a little bit more than what it actually is. And so that's where we're able to get a little bit of a better price. 
And, and where do you start, Kathy? Do you reverse engineer your numbers? You kind of start with the, as you called it, the ARV, the after repair value, and then work your way backwards? Or do you kind of look at the purchase price and say, I think it's going to cost this much. And therefore, I think we can probably add another 20% margin on top of that. Or how do you run your numbers? So at the very beginning, that's how I do it is I look at the price. I think, okay, what is it going to cost for this property to look beautiful um, and be presentable and uh, fetch top dollar for today? However, when, I'm, when I get really serious about it, I do reverse engineer always because the, the numbers don't really lie. So it has to be by solds. We rarely become that, that um, unicorn, if you will, where everybody else is sold for a certain price and now we're getting 20% over. It's usually you have to stick within that sold price um, area. And, and so then that's when I'll you know, figure that out and then um, think, okay, what's my budget or what's my rental budget? What is it gonna cost to hold this property? And then see if the, the sale price makes sense and see if that, uh, that property, that flip does make sense. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you looking at um, a certain demographic of end user as well? Like, are you sticking to that sort of still in that starter home range where the bulk of the, of the things are trading or are you doing like luxury sort of high-end uh, flips? So I love luxury. That is absolutely <laughs> my, I just love it. It's, it's definitely where I would love to be. It doesn't work here in the Fraser Valley. So yes, mm -hmm. I stick to a little bit more entry level, something that's, uh, you know, for a, a first time home buyer or a young family that wants to get into a house. Um, it's definitely for, for a sort of a more entry level middle of the road kind of a property. Yes. So let's, let's back up a little bit. Cause we kind of skipped over a few things. Who's the first person that you put on your team in order to start assembling a, basically a business of flipping properties. Cause when you're doing five at a time, that is not, you know, a side hustle. That is your full-time job. That is. So my very, very first person ever is somebody that I can use for support. Um, as you know, having done flips, uh, they don't always go smoothly. <laughs> and not all of your trades are going to be nice and kind and, and uh, work well with you. So I, that is the very first person I ever have is somebody who will support me. Um, secondly, I like a person who actually can do anything and everything. But now that I've done this a few times, I have a team of people. And it's, it's beautiful when you form relationships with people that they'll just come when you need them. Um, it is great to have somebody. I mean, I, I'm fairly familiar now and fairly well versed with what I need and when I need it, but I love having somebody that can take over. Uh, so I do typically hire a sort of, I guess, a project manager, if you will. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. Do you do you sort of general contract things out and hire trades um, and, you know, handy people and everything, all the others to fill in the gaps? Or do you hire a general contractor and a project manager? No, typically I just do the general, con the, all that stuff myself, um, because I already have trades that I've worked with for a long time and they know what, you know, what my expectation is. I know exactly what their work is like, what their work ethic is. I find that to be extremely important as well is the work ethic. Uh, I do like people who share the same work ethic as me. It's nothing worse than walking through your property and thinking, oh boy, that person's kind of lazy when you're, you know busting them, you're behind. So, um, but I do like to have a project manager because I do take on quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of, uh, of other stuff, uh, whether it's another project or like you said, this development, I, I need to be free also for that. And so to have somebody that I can just uh, have a phone call with for them to carry on that project is really, really uh, useful for me. And, and this is a, a question I get a lot of that people want to get into flipping, you know, they're kind of saying like, I'm not getting preferential pricing from my trades. Um, and I al always say, well, like, how often are you hiring them? Are you hiring them once every once, once, and then you never call them again for seven years, you're not going to get preferential pricing at, at that point. So where was that tipping point for you where you found that people did start returning your calls, showing up when you asked them to, 
and, and getting, you know, better pricing. Did it take a little bit of time to build that or was it just a relationship thing that you were able to establish right away? I think I actually got into it at a time where uh, renovations weren't booming like they are right now and building wasn't booming. And so people were looking for work and I was looking to establish those relationships as well right away. I do pay very close attention with a very critical eye uh, at what they do and how they do it. I will even then share them. But I do believe that it's from the very beginning. It, it's that first, I don't want to call somebody and then kind of go through eight different finishers. I'd like to just call uh, one, see how he works, see what, what his end product looks like. Can we work together? And then I like to establish that relationship. If I can't use them, then I always make sure that I refer them to somebody else so that there's always that steady work for them. And then I'm not sort of in the background, like you said, you know, calling them once every seven years. Um, I find it's really important to just uh, establish those relationships right away. The other thing, though, is I don't really believe in getting huge discounts from my trades. I like to treat them really well because I find that then they do a great job for me and they don't see me as that person that's always looking for a deal. Um, so I do like to make sure, um, you know, that I pay them what definitely what they're worth. Uh, I mean, it's, it's nice to get a little break here and there um, for sure. And, and when you do give people a lot of work and steady work, um, they do tend to do that for you. So, mm -hmm. well, and I think you brought up a great point. It's it, it's more about and and flipping is really about timelines more so than it is necessarily about you know um, squeezing everybody for a dollar. I think that if you can get your project finished a month faster, that's going to save you uh, potentially a lot of money. And so I think to your point, you know, if you can get people to just show up, that's that's one of the biggest struggles. I think, especially with with the way the things are going right now. What um, let's talk a little bit about financing. You said you have five projects on the go. You have partners. Does that mean that the partners are coming in in a, in a joint venture perspective? Are they, uh, and are you using bank financing for these projects or are you going private? So typically we start off at the first 65 to 75% with a B lender and the rest of it is all private, uh, whether that's registered funds or uh, just cash straight mm. uh, unsecured. Uh, it's, I find that, that, people are really willing to get behind you and your projects if you've, at least if you've shown that you've had a few successful projects. And so that hasn't been a real stumbling block for me. And uh, I do like having the security of that B lender though, uh, because it's a bigger chunk right away. And then it allows me to do, uh, to move on to other stuff and not have to worry too much about having a number of lenders that I have to uh, call or, or, or uh, interact with. It's, it's just a nicer chunk um, and an easier, it's an easier way to do it. So that's how I prefer it. So what's your strategy buying uh, with a B lender, raising some potential private money to, to supplement what you need to do. And then you're a hundred percent owner, or are you bringing those folks in with, with RSP money or unsecured as a, as an equity uh, owner and, and owning a portion of the profits as well? No, typically for these single single projects that I do, there isn't a, a whole lot to share with for equity afterwards. So it's always just straight interest. Right. Yeah. So borrowing straight private debt equity. versus private equity. Yeah. Exactly. What are your timelines right now um, with 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 COVID and the craziness and and how are well let let's answer that question. Then I have a follow up question, which uh, I'm sure you know what's coming. So I, I typically have super tight timelines because uh, just going back a, a minute uh, to another point that we were making uh, with trades, I would rather actually have them show up, like you said, and come to get the job done. Because I think sometimes we get a little bit uh, hung up on what the trades are charging us and we forget to look at our carrying costs. And sometimes that $1,000 you're going to pay extra to one trade will save you $5,000 in carrying costs. But I, I think sometimes we as flippers tend to see that very immediate expense and we forget to look at that uh, entire picture. It's actually two duplexes that I'm working on right now. So four units altogether, separately titled. Um, there was asbestos in there. So the design called for moving the kitchen. 
literally from one side of the room to the other, but because of the asbestos content, it had to be abated. So the abatement company does work on their own timeline. They were amazing. They really were, but it took quite a bit longer than what my timeline allowed. And then the unfortunate thing is after they started working, they found mold and I will not let a property just be covered up with something like mold. So we had to remediate that. Um, you know, my, my uh, goal is to always have a beautiful, safe home for another family. Uh, so I'm two months, about two months behind right now. There was also a change of trade. Um, if none of that happened, we'd be right on time. Mm -hmm. So lumber costs have um, tripled uh, in the last couple months. So how are you insulating against things like that? Do you have an overage built in um, to your timelines and also to your, to your budgets? So luckily for that project, I only needed about four, two by fours. <laughs> but the mission I'll, I'll sell you for, for right. 10,000 bucks. I'm, that's I'm what literally. I paid for them. I think. <laughs> <laughs> digging through people's <laughs> recycling right now. Oh, look, can we use this piece? Um, the mission project, however, I think we've pretty much bought out a couple of the stores and it, it is a bit of a shock, I have to say. You know, when you're buying a two by four for $3 one day and the next month is like 10. Um, so with that one, we decided to do quite a bit more of the work ourselves. Uh, it did, it, at this point in time, it hasn't increased the timeline um, a lot because we've been able to put in those two or three solid days or four solid days, which is exactly what a framer would be doing as well. So uh, right now, um, we were able to save a little bit on that, um, on the cost of that, uh, of the, um, the framer. We did it ourselves um, and we're still okay right now. What's the average rate that you're paying when you're borrowing? So with the B lenders, it's anywhere from 4.9 to 6.5%. Uh, I think on the uh, duplexes, it's, we're at 6.2%. Um, and then RSPs typically is about 8 to 10%. It depends on the person and the, you know, the lender, what they want. I, I really like to work with a lender and ask them what they are looking for, what they're expecting. Uh, and then the private uh, unsecured funds, typically we're looking at um, anywhere from 10 to 14% with 12 to 14% being more the usual scenario. Yeah. And I love that uh, you, you're talking about those kinds of numbers because, you know, one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel is, is uh, the TFSA maximizer. And I talk about an average rate of, of 12%, you know, and then people get confused because I talk about using your RSP money at a higher rate and your, uh, your TFSA money at a higher rate. And people on my channel comment all the time, like who borrows money at 12%, you know, who are these idiots? Or like, how do you make this work? I'm like, people do it all the time in real estate. We're always borrowing at eight, 10, 12%. And the people that know how to do it, know how to utilize the capital can do it well and they can still make money. So um, you know, if you don't mind, what is the average return you're hoping to achieve on a, on a standard flip that you're doing right now in your, in your market? Right. So it's usually about 30% increase. Um, that's what we've been getting, um, over the last, however many handful that we've done. Um, you know, it does have to have some, obviously increase because that's our job. It's like me going to work for say a lawyer, I'd be getting paid for those hours that I work as a, an investor. Um, and, and I have to ensure that my investors get paid, uh, you know, the lenders that they get paid what, what I've promised them, what they're mm -hmm. expecting. Uh, so I usually like about a 30% increase. So 30% increase on the existing purchase or what your costs are. And you're looking for like a 30% margin. 30% margin. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. And I think that's why when you look at uh, people that 
you know, doing what you're doing basically have turned flipping into a business where you can do multiple projects at the same time. Um, there's enough margin there to make, to make it worth your while. Um, what's your final piece of advice for anybody that's looking to get into the space of, of turning over properties and, uh, and potentially making a living at doing it? I would say, do go ahead and get yourself educated, but don't stop there. You have to take action at some point in time. And immersion is literally the best teacher. Always have somebody that uh, can walk you through it. If you are newer to it, there are a lot of us out here that love sharing our knowledge and love supporting other people. So uh, definitely get educated, but take action and find a mentor. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Kathy, thanks so much for um, taking some time today to share your knowledge. I know this is going to be hugely helpful for people. Um, if you guys enjoyed this session with Kathy, do me a favor. Uh, go ahead and hit that like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell. And I would love to hear in the comment section below uh, what your favorite strategy is. Maybe it's flipping properties, maybe it's not. And if you are flipping properties, I'd love to hear what rate you're paying your private borrowers because I think this is a great topic. So you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Kathy, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join me. I hope at some point the world will go back to normal and we can eventually meet in person because I know we've been chatting lots in this format, but um, I need to get out to the West Coast and see all my friends in BC. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. And I look forward to connecting soon. Thanks so much, Darren. And you are always welcome. BC will welcome you with open arms. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Kathy. We'll talk soon.